Hello, my name is René Weber. I'm a full professor here at UC Santa Barbara. Um, I'm the director of the Media and Neuroscience Lab at UC Santa Barbara. And part of our research in our lab is about narratives and persuasive messages. So the question is, what is an engaging message? It turns out that if we look into what makes messages engaging, that moral information plays a crucial part. If something touches on moral conflict, moral violations, where people are treated, for example, unfairly and unjustified, that is something that is relevant for you and that makes you act upon the content of this message. So if we say that's evidence, wouldn't it be nice if we were able to analyze on a global level what are the moral informations, what are the moral frames in, for example, news, even in movies, or any other collection of words? That's what we do in our um, lab with the so-called MONA project. MONA stands for Moral Narrative Analyzer Project. What we do is, in one component of this MONA project, we capture global news, so what happens right now in the news, globally, we do this every 15 minutes across the day, and capture what is news content in that moment, and then we apply a so-called data mining, big data pipeline, consists of various methodologies, to find out what these moral frames are. So we can create maps of moral information and how these maps of moral information change over time at literally any 15 minutes during a day. So there is a lot to say about that and how this actually methodologically works. And here's where I refer to Freddie because Freddie is one of our five lab members who is primarily involved in this research. So, Freddie, why don't you come over and talk a little bit about the methodological details. Hi, so thanks for the introduction from René Weber. My name is Frederick Hopp, and I'm a graduate student in the department here at UC Santa Barbara Communication, also a lab member of the Media Neuroscience Lab. And as René Weber already said, moral values have a big motivational relevance for message sharing behavior, for how we process and evaluate messages. But as you can imagine, extracting moral values from text data is really difficult because it's a latent construct. It's not something that is directly clear what are these values about. And I'm here today to show you some methodologies that we apply to sort of extract as best as we can the latent nature of these moral values from text. To extract moral values from text, we develop the Moral Narrative Analyzer, which is an online platform that combines both human coder training as well as content analysis procedures. And after a substantial experimentation, we found out that a simplified coding task in which humans simply use a highlighting tool to annotate text works best to extract more information from text. So as you can see in this slide, for example, on the left hand, you can see this is the typical interface that people use in our lab to code moral information in newspaper articles. So, People use this highlighting tool as you would in high school whenever you're highlighting a portion of text to identify more information in text. On the right side of this uh, slide, you can see how we do this task over scripts of movies. So in this case, Gone Girl. So people go through scenes of movies, highlight certain portions of text, maybe even identify if there's a conflict in this text. Now, you might wonder, where is the computational part in all of this? So, for example, for our analysis of movie scripts, we use what is called a sentiment analysis tool to extract sentiment from scenes. And there, we, as you can see on the left side here, this displays a graph over the whole movie where we can see how does sentiment change across this whole movie so we can pre-select certain scenes to provide for coders for annotation. For example, we might want to select scenes that are very negative or very positive that might have interesting moral information. What we can also do is, as you can see on the right side here, we can construct so-called character networks by looking which characters co-occur in dialogue and action descriptions and thereby build a character network that tells us which is the most central character in the script, which are interesting correlations or associations between characters, for example, who converses most often. So in this case, you can see for Star Wars Episode 5, 
that Han and Leia are the most, uh, the primary characters that converse most often, where you can see Luke, for example, and Yoda, they also have a stronger edge, which kind of suggests, okay, these characters co-occur in a lot of scenes. So Mona is great if you want to code a sample of newspaper articles or movie scripts. Now, what is a sample? Think of a sample as something as a small selection of the bigger part. Okay, so the big population of news articles means every news article that is out there in this world. Now, you cannot possibly code every newspaper article that's out there in this world with humans. Why? Humans take their time to code articles. Humans might be better than automatic methods because they're really precise. They think about things. But if you want to detect trends at a global level, then human coders might not be the good choice. So what can we do? Well, since we extract more information in a word sequence form, so remember, people highlight text in our Mona system, we can aggregate and transform these highlights to build so-called moral dictionaries. Now, you might wonder, what exactly is a moral dictionary? Think of it this way. As you can see here on this slide, we have certain words that co-occur with certain moral categories. What does co-occur mean? This means that our coders highlighted these words more often when they were given a certain moral category to focus on. So, for example, the fairness category, you can see the word fraud. And I think we all can agree that fraud suggests cheating, right? So what a dictionary does in the end, it takes a newspaper article or a movie script or maybe even a novel and looks, okay, how many times does the word fraud occur in this article? Does it occur one time? Does it occur two times? And it doesn't just do this for one word, it actually looks at all our words that are in the dictionary and counts them. And this way, we can sort of generate a moral profile of an article. We can say, okay, this article or movie script really emphasizes caring, fairness, maybe even sanctity. So, having told you a little bit about our moral dictionary, the reason why we are building this dictionary is because we want to look at moral frames at scale. We don't just want to look at moral frames in a sample. No, we want to analyze moral trajectories in global online news that are happening at 15 minute intervals around the world. Okay, thank you, Freddy. That was great. So why does this all matter? Good question. Let me, let me explain it this way. Events happen every day. And we know that news organizations report about those events. We also know there's a theory behind it that, of course, events lead to reporting about these events. But we also know that reporting about events can actually trigger subsequent events. So there's a dynamic involved between how news organizations, journalists report about events, and what events subsequently may happen, or what's the probability of events that may happen part of unrelated to reporting, but part related to reporting. So if you have information on global level, global scale, how events unfold, as you can see in this map, that's a map over time where and when events happen. And if we have information on how reporting about these events are framed, morally framed, include moral information of which we know they are motivationally relevant and that may drive those events. As you can see in this map, that's a map that shows you how these moral frames unfold over time. We can apply some statistical advanced magic called spatial temporal modeling and extract relationships between these moral information, between these moral frames and events that happen. That we can predict reporting out of events that should work right? because people report about events. But the interesting question is, is it possible that we actually use the reporting and then predict the probability of subsequent events? Think about protests, demonstrations. Usually people have a reason why they go to the street and protest about a certain issue that they care about. I would even argue most of this issue 
can be morally framed. As I said earlier, if you see that someone is unfairly treated and this unfair treatment is unjustified, that makes you upset. That might be the reason why you actually go to the streets and protest. So, if we have this information about how information and how news are framed morally, we may be able to use this information and then actually predict when, where, and in what intensity those protests may occur. So, as Rene already told you about, we are interested in the relationship between events that are happening in the real world and certain news frames that follow these events. So, as you can see on this slide, for example, we recorded spikes in certain news themes. Themes, for example, could capture anything from vaccination, terror, to immigration. Now, if you look at this slide, you can see a huge spike in the terror theme around March 23rd, which coincidentally happened when the Brussels terror attack happened. We see a similar spike in terror themes on June 13th, when there was the Orlando nightclub shooting. Now, look at the theme of immigration, for example. We can see that news coverage, news outlets, talk more about immigration when there was the Brexit. And, incidentally, also, this theme got a bigger trajectory during the US election. And the green graph shows the theme cyber attack. Now, whenever you look at the spikes in this theme, this doesn't necessarily mean that there actually was a cyber attack. It rather means that during this period of time, there was an increase in news articles that reported about a cyber attack. For instance, in this case, you can see that the theme cyber attack was especially salient during the statement on Russia's involvement in the US election. There are two other cyber attack spikes that you can observe. One that was during the second presidential debate, which, as you can see, followed the statement on Russia's involvement. So we could make maybe make the argument that part of the US presidential debate was the discussion of cyber attacks. And lastly, we can see a big spike in the cyber attack theme whenever Harry Reid called for James Comey's resignation. So, with a push of a button, we can now detect the digital footprint, if you want, that news articles leave out there for us to detect, for example, the political climate of a society right now. What are current topics that are highly discussed at a certain point in time in a given society? Maybe it's about terror. Maybe it's about immigration. Maybe it's about cyber attacks. Let's move this to a different domain. As, as Freddie has explained, our moral narrative analyzer, Mona, uh, is applied in the news narrative domain, but we can also apply Mona in the fictional narrative domain, such as movies that we all like that much. Think about that at a regular normal standard day, all the Hollywood studios, they get about 30 to 100 film scripts every day. People from all over the world send them film scripts. That means a text file of hundreds of pages with text that tells people who says what, with what intention, in what setting. That's how they shoot the movie. And because they get hundreds of film scripts every day, there is a problem how do you select film scripts that may be good scripts and lead to well-performing, interesting movies? And which one might be the little bit artsy, still great movies, but may not be the next big blockbuster movie? As you can imagine, this has directly financial implications. So how it's done now, largely, not exclusively, but largely, those film scripts are sent to film students. They read it. Those are different film students. They change from day to day sometimes. They get paid, but they read the scripts and make a gut decision whether this might be an interesting movie or not. And then there's a huge selection going on, and those scripts that are selected move on to the next round where another group of experts will talk about these film 
So Mona comes in here that if we know that more conflict is the interesting part of a movie, the crucial scenes in a movie all are about more conflict. Not in all movies, but in most of the movies. If we have a tool that can help us computationally process a large amount of text data, such as film scripts, and helps us to understand what are the character relationships, how are the character relationships framed by moral information, how does this moral information translate into a moral conflict between two or groups of characters, how does this dynamic of moral conflict unfolds over the course of a movie, then even more important, if we can track and store all this information, it's not lost from one student to the next student that will look at these film scripts. So we can actually learn from this information in the past and then maybe able to make even predictions how these movies perform economically. This is really interesting. So, but it's getting even crazier. Now that we have a good understanding of what moral information is, how can we capture more information in various text, so-called corpora, huh? collection of text, film scripts, news, could be also Twitter feeds or other text corpora. Now that we know how to do that, the question is now, if we say that more information becomes motivationally relevant, you act upon it, you have a higher probability of observing certain events, as I explained before. There's a higher probability that a movie is better working if it touches on certain more information dynamics of more conflict. Then the question arises for an academic. Why? Why is that the reason? And here we can say, there's a reason why morality has evolved. There's a reason why humans have a very specific sense of morality. Non-humans, there's a controversy to what extent foundations of morality are also implemented in non-human mammals largely. But I think we agree all that a very fine sense of morality is particularly indicative for a human capacity. So, if all what I just told you is true, if we can build these relationships, and if we know that morality and moral information that we use in narratives that we tell each other, it must have served a very specific function in our evolutionary past. So now it becomes relevant, how would we study that? We cannot go back thousands and thousands of years and observe humans and how they exchange narratives and how they were morally framed and was there a different moral frame thousands of thousands of years ago. This is just not possible. Those artifacts are lost. So what brain scientists do is they kind of make an assumption. They say, obviously, our biological structures in our heads, our brain, they have evolved over time. And they have evolved to serve very specific survival relevant functions. With this idea, you could make the argument that how we process more information biologically, neurally, in our brains is a window into our evolutionary past. So if these moral information foundations or domains are motivation relevant, they should leave a trace in our biology, how we process it. For example, I'll give you one example. If it indeed is true that we evaluate more information along those foundations, Freddie mentioned fairness, there is also an authority domain, there's a purity or sanctity domain, there's a harm domain, there's a loyalty domain. If this is true, you would expect that these different domains or foundations are processed in some way differently in our biology and our brain. So the question is, are there dissociable networks that process this information differently? So here now, a whole range of quite complex statistical methods, they're all related to 
concepts in data mining and big data come into play. So how do we actually study how the brain processes information? How do we do this on a more statistical, methodological level? I don't have the time to guide you through the whole idea how we collect brain data. Just, just believe me that we have a machine. The machine is called an fMRI, which stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. It's a machine where there is a tube and you go into this tube and it, it captures slight magnetic variations that are induced by essentially how much energy you use to process information in your brain. And then once we get all this data, now Freddy comes in again because he will do all the analyses and can give you a little bit more detail how we actually process this information. But I can tell you already with this work, we are able to find and identify that indeed those different moral foundations are processed indissociable, which means in different neurological structures, which gives us some hint that indeed there is a biological foundation of what we're doing here. So my last thing that I'm saying, let's say we can make the link from our, we call it behavioral world, where we look at you know, how content unfolds, how events happen, how people behave, to the neural world, how our biological structures, our brains processes information. Would it be cool if we can actually use the biology and variants generated in our brains to predict behavioral outcomes in the real world? This sounds really crazy, I know, but there is a new procedure, a new paradigm, if you want, that became some traction within the last three to six years. It's called the brain as predictor approach that actually uses information on how you process stimuli out there in your brain and uses this variance generated in your brain to predict subsequent future behavioral outcomes of the person you measure, but even more crazy, even per uh, behavior of people unrelated to the person you actually measure their brain responses to messages. So this all what we explain is sort of a research program. It all links together. There's much more to say to it. In a little bit, Freddie can talk more about how we actually do the brain imaging. So I explained to you our procedure, how we extract more information from text. Now let's talk a little bit about how do we measure moral information that is presented in the brain? How do we measure how moral information is decoded and encoded in our brains? So to do this, as you can see on this slide, we set up an fMRI experiment in which participants, while they underwent fMRI scanning, were reading about different moral violations. For example, in this case, you can see that the participant read, you see a girl ignoring her father's orders by taking the car after her curfew. And then we had participants simply rate, well, is this extremely morally wrong? Is this not so wrong? And after doing this, we ask ourselves, okay, while people read these so-called moral vignettes, they're examples for specific moral violations, how do we find out which brain regions were activated by people read these vignettes. And here, again, computational approaches help us to find out which regions corresponded to a certain stimulus, in this case, our more violation examples, we train a so-called machine learning classifier. This classifier essentially learns, okay, here is a brain activity pattern. What was the stimulus that the participant was presented at this specific point in time? So the machine learns, okay, here's some brain activation and here's a stimulus. Now we teach the machine this association across a certain proportion of our data. And once the machine has learned this association, we then test how good does this machine classify new brain activity. In other words, can the machine figure out by just giving the machine brain activity which stimulus someone was shown? 
And if this classification is above chance, so above 50%, then we say this was a successful classification. Now, I know I kept you waiting for this answer. Still, where is small information represented in the brain? What we did is we used what's called a search light to look for certain regions of interest or ROIs, ROIs in the brain that our classifier classified correctly as morally relevant. They were associated with a certain moral stimulus. Now, if you look at this slide, you can see, for example, that the precuneus and the medial prefrontal cortex were especially likely to be activated whenever someone was reading a moral violation. On the right side, you can also see that there was some activation in the insula and in the temporal lobe. Now, we did one last analysis. We can group moral values into a category that focuses on group cohesion, hierarchy structures, and cleanliness, and these moral values are called binding moral domains. And there are also the individualizing moral domains, which are care and fairness. They stress the importance about individual freedom. And we know from the literature, for example, that conservatives and liberals value these two different categories differently strong. So we know that conservatives value the binding domains more strongly and that liberals value the individualizing domains more strongly. So it's really interesting if you think about it that conservatives and liberals sort of have these differences in what they perceive as important moral values. Conservatives value the binding domains more. What does binding mean? Well, over evolutionary history, it was really important for us that we stay together in a group. So these moral values enforce group cohesion. They enforce that we stick to our tradition, to our hierarchy structures, but that we also stick to cleanliness, for example, to avoid the infection with pathogens. So what about the moral values of liberals? Well, it turns out that liberals value the individualizing domains of caring and fairness, which primarily are about upholding the individual, the freedom of the individual, that we care for one another, that we exchange, that we engage in fair exchanges. And it turns out that liberals value these domains way more than the binding domains of loyalty, authority, and purity. Now that we know about the differences that underlie conservatives and liberals in terms of their moral value systems, we can look if these differences also become apparent at the brain level. Can we see that the binding domains are activated under different patterns compared to the individualizing domains? We actually found out, as you can see on this picture, that the binding moral domains are more strongly activated in the medial prefrontal cortex and the temporal prior to food junction. This is really helpful and interesting for us because we can, on the long run, maybe use this information to better understand ourselves, essentially. If conservatives rely on different moral values and liberals rely on different moral values, well, maybe we can change the way we communicate in such a way that we all understand each other better that we will see a less polarized political system. How can we frame messages, for example, that they appeal to certain groups that might have a conservative ideology? How can we frame messages to people that have a liberal ideology? Finally, I'd like to share some of our future ideas that we have for this lab with you. So, for example, you have learned about Mona. Of course, we want to fine tune and extend Mona. We want Mona not just to code moral information in newspaper articles, movie scripts, but maybe even in political speeches or in books, novels at some point. Further, in the future, we want to extend our Mona system to not only just look at film scripts or narratives, but also books. And 
We also want to learn about the relationship between events and news frame and the bigger picture. And lastly, we're interested, how does the brain come in here? How does the brain explain how we process information at a certain level? And how can we use computational tools to answer these kinds of questions? So learning about computational methods can seem really intimidating, but trust me, I started coding a year and a half ago, and so far I've learned a lot and it's been really, really fun. You think of problems in new ways, you can tackle amazing questions in different ways. It's really, really fun. And with some effort, you can definitely change a lot. So I hope you enjoyed our little introduction into some work of our lab. Um, if you want to find out more about our research, why don't you go online and find us in the internet? Uh, our website is um, medianeuroscience.org. And as Freddie said, um, some of the things we do here sound difficult. And I'm not saying they're not difficult, they are difficult, but you can do it, you can learn it. And who knows, if you're interested about this research and you find it relevant and important someday, you may be a graduate student here in our lab, so I encourage you to go to our website and find out more and think about a career in communication, media psychology, and cognitive neuroscience. That's what the Media Neuroscience Lab bundles together as a new, and from our perspective, exciting research.